I think having one person to be able to speak all of the languages that they wish to at once, I think to me, that's magic. You deliver one message and to know that it is touching, you know, hundreds of people in the language that they want to hear it in, that your voice is being replicated in many, many other languages. To me, that's magic. Who doesn't want to speak every language in the world? And by partnering with professional interpreters, you get to. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Gabriela Siebach, Director of Interpreting Services at Cisco Linguistic Services. She has more than 15 years of professional experience in multilingual services and settings ranging from military to public sector to multinationals to nonprofit organizations. Gabriela holds a graduate degree in Spanish translation and interpretation from the world-renowned Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much for joining me. Welcome to the podcast, Gabriela. Well, Gabriela, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to have you on board here. Um, I think we're going to have a great time chatting about what it is you do in the industry. Um, but I think before we get started, can you just give me a background of how you got into the space that you're in and uh, sort of a little bit of your history, your story would be great. Well, thank you for having me. It is a great pleasure to be here with you, Richard. And um, wow, my story has a very roundabout path. I got into multilingual events um, just kind of by chance. A lot of us that work in the multilingual space do. I am actually the daughter of immigrant parents in the United States. And with that came a lot of linguistic challenges for my mother in particular. And, you know, just kind of my career path was meant to go into business and it evolved based by a lot of luck, a lot of chance. I served in the US military and that's kind of how I learned about linguistics to start. After leaving the military, after one tour, I decided that I wanted to stay in linguistics some way, somehow. I started working with a lot of public service sectors. I went back to school to get a master's in the related field. And that's how I discovered the world of multilingual events and that, again, roundabout path led me to what I do now. And I work with a lot of event professionals and do some consulting on the linguistic aspects of multilingual events. And just, I really enjoy doing it. And most recently, I've been working a lot with MLMs. And it has been just a great opportunity to learn a little bit about professions that aren't my own and contribute by offering my insight in terms of language and access and inclusion. Okay, so a multilingual event is, I mean, you're going to have people coming from all over the world to one central place, or is it an online thing? And how do how does a multilingual, a multilingual event look? Well, it looks a lot of different ways. And like you said, it could be a lot of people from all around the world coming to one place. Um, I think in Europe, you have a lot of examples of just having multilingual individuals in a single place. And we have the same thing in the United States where you can be in one place having only local attendees and there's a multilingual need. People that speak different languages that prefer to speak about certain topics in a particular language, which means that in order to be inclusive to everyone and help them all participate actively and engage with the event, you need to somehow provide them the space to either absorb the information in their language or be able to contribute in their language. And of course, this is something that happens on site, but it also happens remotely. So there's a lot of either virtual or hybrid events where you have individuals from around the world meeting at the same time. And I think one of the biggest challenges there is just getting the time zone right so that you have people from China and people from the US able to participate actively. Um, some going to bed really late and some waking up super early. <laughs> And then what, what, how does it actually physically work? What is the technology behind it? So that's a great question. There are a lot of different technology solutions. Um, if you're on site, it becomes fairly simple yet complicated at the same time. There's a specialized equipment that you can bring into an event space so that you're able to have interpreters in booths, which is just kind of a stand-up booth that gets set up to 
help them be separate from the event, but still have full view and access to the event so that they can interpret as accurately as possible. And then everybody that needs to access the event in a different language has their own headset. So while the event is happening live, they're able to fully participate and engage with the presentations, with the event itself, yet listen to the language that is of their preference in order to absorb the material. If it's, it's a virtual... Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah no. It's no, crazy. the virtual space gets a little bit more complicated. Of course, there's um, video conferencing platforms that exist nowadays that have really evolved and allow for multilingual participation, but there's also a lot of different platforms that are designed specifically for multilingual events that have special audio channels and truly allow for seamless interaction between participants that speak other languages. Now, a lot of companies think that they can do this themselves. Um, I'm sure you got some horror stories to regale me with. Well, they do. Um, and and I think they, that many people have their the ability to do certain things. We actually recently partnered with other event professionals and put together a guide that talks people through putting it together. But I do have to say that one of the steps in our guide is to work with a language service provider, somebody that knows the linguistic aspect because there's a lot of different aspects to multilingual events and some of them an event professional can do themselves. Um, a corporate team can put together and think through a lot of the logistical aspects themselves, but the language component can sometimes get a little tricky. You might need professionals on your side for that. Sorry, I just my light just went off above me. I just want to switch it on again for some reason. The jolly thing decided it didn't want to play ball anymore. Um, there we go. Let's there just come go. back on again. How strange is that? Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> um, these things happen in the best of regulated families. Um, so was, I was a few years ago, I was in Dallas mm -hmm. and I was at a convention there and there were 20,000 odd people um, at this convention. And there was, a, a, I think this must be what you're talking about. Along the one wall, there were these booths mm -hmm. and inside these booths were people um, who had earphones on, who were listening to the presentations and who were talking. And everybody in the room was able to listen to the presentation in their own language. And there were people there from Russia and Indonesia and India mm -hmm. and, and, and Europe and all over the place. And I presume that's kind of the thing that you are talking about. That is exactly what I am talking about. And those booths that you talk about, they each had their own set of equipment. They had their own audio input and they each had an FM transmitter that was transmitting that interpreter's voice to a specific frequency that was being received by audience members into their personal receivers. I see. So they clip that onto their belt, they put the headset on and they hear it in their own language. Now, I should imagine that is a, a wonderful solution. If you have got a big multinational um, organization, it's a wonderful way of having people come together and feel included in, in what is otherwise going to be quite an exclusionary type um, situation. If, if you don't understand English and everything is happening in English, that that's, can't be fun. Absolutely. And sometimes it's not even about whether you understand the language or not. A lot of times it's about whether it's a language that truly speaks to you. Um, specifically in the multilingual marketing space, a lot of it is about talking to this very diverse sales force that you have out there that's supporting your entire company, right? The business model is built on direct sales and it's built on individuals buying into your strategy and buying into your message and your story. Well, it's difficult to buy into something when it's completely foreign. When you start to receive it in your own language, that's where you really get the buy-in. And that's really what these multilingual events are about, are about touching people by reaching them in their language, speaking to them. And how long does something like this take you to set up? I mean, if, you, if we said to you, right, we're going to do it on this Saturday, how long will it take you to actually get everything prepared? This must be a huge job. It is a huge job. And hopefully if we're doing something this Saturday, we've been talking about it for months. Um, it's very uncommon that events are put together and organized from one day to the next um, or from one week to the next, although it has happened. 
usually it's for smaller events that you would do something so quickly. I can tell you that in terms of setting up the equipment, we can have technicians on location the day before they set up and test everything. The day of the event, your presenters, your organizers, and all of your participants show up along with the interpreters. Equipment is distributed as needed and everyone is able to access the event. But a lot of the magic happens before the event and it's happening in logistical preparation, just like you would prepare any event. And the language component is one of the many logistical aspects that you're putting together for the event. Now, do you get involved in any other aspects of the event? So if we came to you and said, we need a, an event for 10,000 people, we've got an MLM company, people are gonna be flying in from all over the world. Could we come to you and say, listen, just sort this out for us, please? Yes, but I would have to say that I wouldn't work alone. My expertise is linguistics, and we would partner with those who are experts in the event sphere. So we would work with other event professionals that help you put together the experience for you. Just like we would work with AV text to handle the AV elements of it, we would work with experts in the specific topics to help organize the agenda and the speakers. So we would be working as a team, and my particular role in that puzzle would be the language. I see. Now, you've produced this white paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like you to tell me a bit about this white paper and, and how people can get hold of it, etc. Can you do that? Absolutely. So it's available on our website. I'll be sharing the link with you. It's well, called just the give it to me now. Okay, what, what is the website? Okay, it's www.cescols.com. Sorry, .me forward slash MLM for CEOs. So we've made it especially available for your viewership. And they'll be able to access it directly. Again, that's www.cescols.me forward slash MLM for CEOs. And it is the definitive guide to flawless multilingual events. It kind of goes through some of the most important steps. It goes through seven steps or seven areas in which you can focus in order to make sure that you have a truly flawless multilingual event. Awesome. Now, just something I want to make sure that the, our audience is 100% clear on. We don't have a deal. I'm not no. getting any kickbacks from this. If you, people go to you, they go to you directly. I'm not getting commissions or anything on this. I mean, we're doing this very much for the love of the MLM industry and trying to help um, people out there find people like yourselves when they need an event. And that goes across the board from new startups who want to put small events together right the way to the big corporates who are looking for somebody um, to help them. Okay, so let's get back to this white paper. This, is, this was a deep dive you guys did. Yes, so we did a deep dive. Um, first of all, it is 100% free. Um, we would love to partner with whoever is looking to put together an event, but it just provides guidance on what to look for even in the language service provider or a partner, even if it's not us. So what are some of the things to look for if they're looking for someone? Maybe they wanna work with somebody local, not somebody that works at the international level. And it just gives them advice of what to look for. We put it together by working with a lot of our other partners who are event professionals and put these events together, just kind of understanding from them what are some of the needs that they have when it comes to multilinguals, some of those lessons learned that were learned the hard way, and just kind of put together what are some of the logistical aspects that people need to put together. And I have to say, the guide starts with planning ahead. As you mentioned earlier, you know, can we do it from one week to the other? Yes, it's possible, but you're going to have more stumbling blocks if you try to put it together in a week than if you have enough time to properly plan and manage all of the logistical aspects. And I presume getting somebody who can listen in English and speak in whatever, um, in Spanish, those are specialized people. They're not just, they don't just, they're not around every corner, I presume. They are not around every corner. And not only that, but we want them to also have the experience and expertise in the specific field that we're in. Not all MLM companies are the same. Not all services or products that are being provided are the same. And we want these interpreters to not only specialize on the language, on the two or three or whatever many languages that we need to provide at the event, but we also need them to be familiar with the services or products that are going to be highlighted or spotlighted during the event so that they can speak to them like experts. I'm with you. And of course, making sure you got the right people, super important. I'll give you an example. This is my horror story. Let's hear it. <laughs> In South Africa, the government 
put on a, a huge um, uh, presentation mm -hmm. and they got a sign language expert to sign. Have you heard the story? Oh, absolutely. It was all over our social media networks for a long time. Yes. So this person could not sign at all. And they were just inventing, <laughs> inventing things as they went along. Now, it's so easy for somebody to tell you they can do it. But mm -hmm. if they haven't been vetted by professionals, you can often land up with somebody who's just waving their arms around in the air <laughs> merrily. Absolutely. That was pretty funny, don't you think? It, I, I think I think it was a good example of proper qualification and vetting and the importance of that in our profession and in being able to truly provide access and inclusion. It's The event won't be very inclusive if the individual that's helping provide that bridge, that link, that communication is not competent. And there, perhaps the language aspect was also missing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the linguistic aspect. They can be perfectly fluent in both languages, but if they're not familiar with the skills and strategies to actually interpret, which can be very taxing and difficult, or if they're not familiar with the specialized terminology that's going to be discussed, then they're not going to be the right fit for the program. I think that's a big one, the terminology, because the person can speak the language, but there might be some technical terminology that they just have no idea. Now, there's no ways that everybody who's doing this can can have they can know all the terminology. Do you provide them with that terminology up front so that they can get familiar with it? So we do that, yes. And a lot of times, especially for MLMs, because again, a lot of times it's the service or the product that's being sold that needs to be spotlighted, we create specialized teams of language professionals that will be partnering with that particular client, with that MLM on a regular basis. We provide them as much information about the products and services ahead of time. And for the events, we request and we truly partner with the organizers of the event to get any kind of presentations, any kind of materials ahead of time. And it's part of the package. You're getting people that are committed to your brand, to your message, that are going to spend hours ahead of time preparing days, weeks even, preparing for the event so that they're as prepared as the presenters that are going to be standing before your audience. And then they can just speak through the issues as quickly as possible. Now, another thing that came, came up that we had a problem with uh, with one of our events is that the technology that we used was not um, valid in the region we were in. So there were certain frequencies that are allowed to be used in certain mm -hmm. countries, and we were using a system that was not actually allowed in that country, and the, the local authorities actually tracked us down and made us switch off the, the systems. So that's another issue that can actually creep up and bite you. It is, which is why it's very important to work with professionals, especially if that's not your area of expertise. You want to work with the team. You want to work with the team that's going to be partnering with local providers, that's going to be partnering with the local experts so that they know if FM transmission is not the right fit for the venue because it may interfere with local law enforcement, for example, but that's not the only thing it could interfere with. It could interfere with the venue's PA system or the venue's security system or their internal AV's communication system. You wanna make sure that you're partnering with all of the different elements to make sure that you're using the right equipment, that you're using the right frequencies or the right kind of transmission. If FM frequencies don't work, then maybe infrared is going to be your option. Oh, wow. So you have infrared systems as well. There are all kinds of different options. Yes. Uh, okay. Any other horror stories? Have you got one as good as mine? <laughs> I, I don't have as many. Luckily, we've been very fortunate to be able to partner with individuals ahead of time. But, you know, we do have horror stories that bring clients to us. Um, sadly enough, we have been working with a large MLM for several years now. And one of the reasons why we had the opportunity to partner with them was inconsistency in message, having different interpreters interpret different aspects or um, the products in different ways. and it really makes a difference for MLMs because you want the sales force that is going to be talking about your products to talk about it the same way. Now, can you imagine wow. having a product that's being described a completely different way in a different language? It could affect the impact that you have in that particular market. And it is actually because of that, that we had an opportunity 
to work with them. Having a product and not being able or selling it in a different way in different languages, sometimes it's needed for cultural reasons, but there are certain specifications to products that are very important to be able to sell the product and not being able to relay that is going to make it awkward. And I mean, that's a good point you bring up because in, in our space, you have got very strict laws about what the distributors may and may not say out in the field. Mm -hmm. And specifically in the States, I don't know if you know this, but every violation that the, the, the authorities catch you on, there's a $30,000 fine. Wow, I was not familiar with that. Yeah. But... So if you make a claim that is incorrect, then and and the and the company is found to be complicit in making that claim, thirty thousand dollars. And for every claim that gets made, it's another thirty thousand dollars. So you've got to be super careful that when that translation is happening, that the claims that that are being made from the mm -hmm. stage are actually legitimate and valid claims because it can get you into a lot of trouble. That can be an expensive exercise. Would have been cheaper just to get some professionals in to do it for you. Absolutely. And I think that one of the biggest ways to solve those kinds of things and make sure that your messaging is consistent is to not only incorporate the verbal interpretation during the event, but also translate, have professionals provide written translation of vital information, spec information or anything like that, that people can take away. So even if there is some kind of miscommunication that happens during the event, because it can happen to anyone, somebody could misspeak and provide misinformation. If you have written documentation with the correct messaging, you can avoid those kinds of fees by being able to prove that the message that you're providing is consistent and it is compliant. Now on the night, these things are stressful. I know we've run them. <laughs> um, do you have somebody who's there to manage the whole process on the evening, making sure that everything is working smoothly? And We do. So usually our teams come with one of the interpreters who will be acting as the lead interpreter. They'll be the ones that will be kind of um, the go between our tech operator who is managing the technology, whether it's on site technology or virtual technology. And then the rest of the interpreters who are each responsible for their own language, they each have their partner and they're collaborating between partners, but also one that's making sure that everybody has the same information so that you don't have 10 or 20 or 30 interpreters coming to the event organizer asking questions or providing feedback, but you have a single point of contact that's the go-between and making sure that everything is happening the way it should. Now, another thing that I've seen happen at these big events is that somebody on the night, one of the interpreters is not well, and they therefore either don't pitch at all, mm -hmm. or they're not up for the task on the night. Do you provide backup people that you can call on at a moment's notice in case of those kind of situations? So those situations um, do happen, and it is very unlikely that you'll be able to have someone with the same level of expertise to be able to step in and serve as the interpreter. We have had it happen, especially with recent world global crisis that we have faced. Um, luckily, it was happening in virtual and we were able to have virtual standby teams that were able to step in. For on-site events, that can become more difficult because when you're dealing with travel, having interpreters come from various locations, it can be very challenging to fly in a moment's notice an interpreter from one location to the next. So a lot of what we do has to do with preparation, with making sure that our interpreters stay healthy for once they get on site and on location, making sure that there is safe transportation and the ability to get from one location to the other. Bar it of all of that, there can also be measures that can be taken to ensure that messaging and information can get to individuals. Interpreters work in teams, because they need to be able to take breaks. Now, if you have a single interpreter that doesn't have their partner because their partner has fallen ill or something else has happened, you can provide less access to information, but prioritize information so that the interpreter can take breaks. They can still provide some of the information people can have access, but maybe focus more on the written documentation and providing them other ways of accessing the information without overtaxing the only interpreter that was able to make it to the event. Well, and is there any chance of having remote interpreters um, come in via a Zoom type situation and interpret from wherever they are in the world? 
Yes, and that would be the hybrid modality. So hybrid can mean a lot of different things. And I um, like the term, but I think it's very vague as well because it, there's many different configurations to hybrid. You can have an on-site event where your interpreters are remote. That would make it hybrid. You have remote interpreters with on-site participants. You can also have an audience that is mixed of remote and on-site participants, but have your interpreters on-site. So then you're broadcasting interpretation and the live event to your remote audience only. You can also have an event where some of your audience and your interpreters are remote and only some of your audience and some of the presenters are on-site. You can also have an event where presenters are either remote or on site. So the configurations for remote can be very different. The only thing is that anything like that needs to be planned ahead. Yeah, the you technology to, is quite tough there. Yes, the technology can be challenging and you need to have the right technology for the right configuration. Now tell me something, this oncoming flood of artificial intelligence, how is that going to impact um, these kind of projects moving forward? Because I've, I've listened to some of these AI uh, um, interpretations, voice interpretations, and they mm -hmm. are quite amazing. They really are. And I think it really depends. They, they have, there's space for it. As you mentioned, interpreters, we are jewels. There aren't many interpreters that have the level of knowledge and command of the specific topics to meet all of the demand that exists in the world. So there is space for technology to come in and assist with providing access when needed. However, there are some elements of technology specifically in AI and current capabilities that limit the use cases for which a the use of AI is appropriate. Um, first of all, AI interpreting is newer it is in the space. A lot of the configurations that are being used are the speech to text to machine translated text back to speech, which means that there's a delay. Oh, okay. So there's going to be a delay from when the machine is able to absorb the content to when it produces it. It is a very, very um, complete in terms of it's able to catch all of the information. When you have very, very fast speakers, humans tend to prioritize information and interpret information as they're able to. Because if you're speaking to me at 200 words per minute, I might have to speak at 140 and be able to process all of the information that you're providing. We're obviously providing less words and some languages like Spanish, which is one of the languages that I command and English, there's a difference. You sometimes need more words in Spanish to say the same thing that you would say in English with just a couple. So if I'm, if I'm already having to use more words and I'm speaking at a lower rhythm than you are, because interpretation is going to be difficult for the audience to absorb if I try to match your speed of speech, then there's already going to be room or a gap in the number of words that are set. So I'm going to have to prioritize information and provide as much of your messaging as possible, but maybe avoid repeating things as many times as you're repeating them to save myself the time. Now, we have seen with some of the examples of AI that AI is able to match you word for word. And I think the delay might be helpful in that. I'm not as familiar with the technology. They're able to get all of the words, but sometimes the context is, is missed because machines are still learning and they're learning to understand emphasis and they're learning to understand the true meaning of the information that's being provided. Something that requires the full brain power of a human taking the message and being able to deliver it. So when it comes to use cases for AI, I think the biggest thing that we should consider is risk mitigation. So how critical is the information that you need to deliver and how much risk is there in the message being accidentally distorted? Because distortion yeah. is more likely to happen with machines than it is with humans. Now, they don't understand what they're saying. They're just regurgitating the information mm -hmm. as best they can. And they're using yeah. incredible algorithms to know what to say. But again, there's no human processing of the information. So there mm -hmm. can be problems or misinterpretations. I'm with you. So quite dangerous. Stay away from it for the moment. Stay away from it if you have priority information to deliver. If you're telling people to join you for a session that's going to take place on July 29, then 
machine translation and machine interpretation, automated or AI interpretation might be able to help you get that message across. But if you have a very important message to share with your sales force about a specific product, you might want to rely on humans to make sure that the right information gets out. I'm with you. Well, that is exciting. Before we close off, I would like you to just tell me your URL, contact, email address, whatever information you want to put out there. Um, if you could give that to me so that we can get that up on the on the on the, on the, uh, the video. I'll also put link it below. I'll link to you below so that people can find you. So off you go. What is your URL? So you can visit our website at www.chescols.com. That's C E S C O L S dot com. And you can reach me directly at G S I E V A C H. That's G C B O C at chescols.com. Fantastic. And can people phone you or would you rather they look you up on? They can, email? they can call me. They can reach me directly um, at our offices at 303-274-2634 or on my cell phone, which is available through WhatsApp or a direct call at 202-830-0110. Okay, and where in the States or where in the world are you prepared to work? We are prepared to wear virtually anywhere in the work in the world. Um, we primarily focus in Europe and the United States. Um, we have some work in Latin America and Canada as well. But the US and Europe are kind of the big hubs for a lot of these international events. And that's where the prime, you know, most of our, our network is. Okay, fantastic. Well, this was wonderful. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Really Same here. Thank it. you, Richard. Thank you for spending this time with me. I hope you found this session informative. But before you leave, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Spotify. And remember, never leave the good stuff till later. <laughs>